Okay. Scripture reading today of God's Word is 1 Corinthians 12 through 12 through 14, and 24b is 26. Just as, <clears throat> just as a body, through one has many parts, but all its many parts from one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, saved or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up one part, but many. But God has put the body together, given greater honor to the parts that lack it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers. If it, <clears throat> with it, if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. So be it. I've never heard Debbie's version before. I'll shout it from the mountaintop. Hey, God. Praise, Praise God. God. Hey, God. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, just I was like, okay. Hey, God. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. Lord, we are so thankful that we can come to you as a father to know that you love us so much that you would come to reside with us that you would send your son to die for us that you would fill us with your spirit lord help us to be a holy righteous set apart people that do proclaim you that do praise you lord lord fill us with your spirit today teach us help us to understand your words we thank you that jesus said he would never forsake us we thank you that that the Spirit will reveal all truth to us and will reveal Jesus to us. We thank you for the place that we can come to worship and the freedom that we have. Let us not take it lightly, Lord, but to serve you with everything that we have. Lord, help us to be joyful and look forward to the hope that we have. Thank you, Lord, for all the wonderful things that you've done and all the things that you are doing and all the things that you will continue to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you got a title, Kim? No. There you go. <laughs> so you're like, you know what this is. Well, you'll have to listen, okay? It's a real one, isn't it? Huh? Isn't it, isn't it a real one? No. No, you made it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you have no idea what it is till you listen along, and then you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Okay, the, but you kind of understand from Debbie's choice of songs that it's about unity, the body, about proclaiming, about living as Jesus lived in this world. Um, scripture said the same thing. I would preach, this is not me, this is someone else saying this, because I am preaching. I would preach, but I'm not trained. I would preach, but I'm not called. I would preach, but someone else is called to do that. That's their job. It's not a great suggestion, it's a great commission. And it's for all people. All authority in heaven and on earth was given to Jesus, and he said, therefore, go. And that doesn't mean that you have to go to the foreign world, utter ends of the earth. It means that you have to be proclaiming Jesus as you go. Now, it's not restricted to just that, but that's an interpretation that I want to use today so that, that you understand that. As you go along day to day in your life, you should be living a life where people see that you're different. A holy life. A life, I don't do this one as much, where you have God examine your heart. He has given you a new heart where, where you continue to ask God to cleanse you from all unrighteousness where you continue a life of repentance, and we'll talk about that some more in a little bit. 
It is something that every single believer must do if you have breath in your lungs to do it. Philip was untrained. He didn't spend three years in ministry with Jesus. In fact, he probably never met Jesus. He never got to hear Jesus preach in person. He never got to see the mighty miracles that were performed. I'm sure that he didn't see the transfiguration of Jesus because we've got three guys accounted for there. Pretty sure of that one. I don't think he was there at the crucifixion or probably saw the empty tomb. He might have went later and they said that's where Jesus was buried. And I don't think he saw Jesus ascend into heaven. He probably didn't even hear the words that we call the Great Commission. Philip was a Greek-believing Jew that may have even come to know Jesus after Pentecost happened. But he could not keep quiet because of God's love for him. It compelled him. It drove him. That his life was not his own. That God could love him so much that he would send his one and only son to die for him. He was compelled to preach Jesus Christ wherever he went. <coughs> Stephen's death didn't stop him. The persecution that separated and drove the church out of Jerusalem didn't stop him. He was not worried because he didn't have the animosity and hatred in his heart to go to the land of the Samaritans. Think about that. We mentioned it last week. If the apostles had been driven from uh, Jerusalem, they would have went around and avoided Samaria. They would have been driven to Galilee, but that's not the Great Commission, is it? Jesus said specifically, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the utter ends of the earth. I take my time and think about it. That's the version I learned. I can't help it. Okay, To the far ends of the earth. <clears throat> that is our commission not just the Twelve's Commission. We've seen it with Stephen. We see it now with Philip. As he went, he could not help but to live a life of love because God first loved him. He couldn't help but proclaim that love because the love of God was inside of him. You know, that'd be a pretty good definition for the Great Commission, wouldn't it? Peter had experienced all of those things but probably would have avoided the land of Samaria because of the, his heart not being clean and pure. He needed Philip's example. Matthew chapter 16, you'll get there if you're reading in the New Testament. Not this week, I guess. You'll get there next week, so you've got a spoiler alert here. In Matthew 16, verse 23, But Jesus turned and said to Peter, this is after Peter's proclamation that Jesus is the Christ, that He is the Son of God. Get behind me, Satan. You know, there are times even as we walk as a Christian, we need to repent. And like I said last week, the picture that I painted was that I felt like Peter and the, the twelve needed to repent because they still had that anger and hatred in their heart towards their brother. How could the church ever grow? How could the gospel be presented to the whole world if we have a stumbling block in ourselves because we don't like that person? Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. That's what you're a stumbling block to. When you don't act like Christ, you're a stumbling block to presenting the gospel message. For you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. We're supposed to put all of those things away. Then Jesus told His disciples, If anyone wants to come after Me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for My sake will find it. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will repay each one according to what He has done." I could give you scripture after scripture that talk about the life that we live knowing the truth. How do we live that life now? We can't live it the way we used to live it. We have to live it fixing our eyes on Jesus. It has to be about Him. And I'm so thankful for what you're doing with introducing the prayer and things in that. We are small. And sometimes when we get small, we think about... We, think about we can't do this or that. When we're small, there's so many things we can do. We can be so 
intertwined with each other that we understand the body parts and how they work and we take uh, care and affection and we cry when we need to cry and we laugh when we need to laugh with the body parts because we are closer. And it doesn't matter about the size, it matters about what's in your heart, how much you love Jesus. <clears throat> Peter heard the words of Jesus. He saw all the things that I talked about, but he wasn't overwhelmed to go to the Samaritans because he had a problem with his heart. It wasn't a problem with his Savior. It wasn't a problem with the power of the Holy Spirit. It was a problem with me, myself, and I. And I have to repent of that. And you're going to hear that word repentance a few more times. Peter needed to see Philip's love. Needed to see him preach. What if Philip would have used the excuse, I'm not called, I'm not trained. I've been driven from my home. I've got to set up my home first and do everything else first. He couldn't help. He might have been building himself a house. He might not have been. He might have been doing whatever, but he couldn't help but to tell people about the joy that was in his heart as he went along wherever life took him. Grocery store, work, whatever it may be. <clears throat> if you remember back from Acts chapter 6, Philip and Stephen were chosen so that Peter could concentrate on preaching and teaching. But like I said, Peter was concerned about preaching and teaching the Jews because that was still a mindset he had. If you remember back to Acts chapter 1 before verse 8, they said, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Samaria would have been against that because they had inc incorporated other gods into their religion. We've got to get rid of that mindset. I grew up in church. Uh, I, I've done this or that. I, I'm a good person. There are none righteous, no, not one. And God can turn stones into the children of Abraham. You are saved by grace. Live your life as though you were saved by grace. In Acts chapter 6, verse 2, we read, So the twelve summoned all the disciples and said, It is unacceptable for us to neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Philip did both, didn't he? Think about that. He waited on tables. He was driven from his home. He probably continued to wait on tables in Samaria. I would like to think that's what he was doing, is helping the poor, and that's what brought about the opportunity. He said, Why are you helping us? Why are you doing this? Because of the love that he had in his heart. Therefore, brothers and sisters, verse 3, select from among you seven men confirmed to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. So I've got to ask, can others see the Spirit of God inside of you? Can they see the wisdom of God inside of you because of the way that you're living your life? <clears throat> we will appoint this responsibility to them and we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, as well as Philip. Then we know the story. One day, Stephen's going along his business, doing his job, and he dies for what he believes, and he professes Jesus Christ to the end. He tells them that they need to repent, that they're stiff-necked, and he also asks our Father in heaven for forgiveness for them, and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What an example. Then Saul persecutes the church. And what does that do? That actually drives the church into Samaria. Acts chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed, that's the Samaritans, when they believed Philip as he preached the gospel of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed and was baptized. He followed Philip closely and was astounded by the great signs and miracles he observed. So now I have to ask you some questions, and we'll answer these as we go along a little bit. Okay, this is not a question first. This is a statement. When someone believes, he is a part of what? The church, the body of Christ, period. You understand that? That means you have a part, and every part is commissioned to live and to preach the gospel message and train up disciples. Got that? 
Every one of us is a part. And we know the scripture. Some parts are more obvious, some parts aren't. But I guarantee you these parts that are less obvious, when they're not working right, the rest of this body is not working right. This arm that's so obvious, I can get by and preach with it tied behind my back. But if my intestines start bothering me or my heart fails, I'm not preaching the word of God, am I? So these other parts that I may not see are very vital. Know what your part is. Know that you've been called of God. Preach Jesus Christ with the joy that He's put in your heart while you have the opportunity as you go along. Look for opportunities to preach, to teach, to proclaim the joy that you have. So here's the questions. How do we know if someone's genuine or not? Hmm. Plenty of scripture I can give you. But I have to ask this question afterwards, and this comes up because you've got to have asked this question while you're reading through this, is Simon saved or not? <laughs> it's a question we want to ask. But does it really matter? Yes and no, and we'll get to that more because it definitely matters because I can give you a ton of scriptures that talk about those in the body of Christ that teach false doctrines. But you and I don't know who's saved and not saved. We go down that road again and we're back right to where Peter is and we start judging people. So that's where I'm at today. We'll get, we'll get to where Jesus talks about discipline in the church a different day. But here we are today and we want to draw people into the kingdom. So we don't go pointing fingers and say, you Samaritan, you. But now Peter does in the scripture point fingers at Simon, and he has a good, good reason to. And Peter had a discerning spirit there. He was, he was able to discern that with Ananias and Sapphira, remember that. So pray for the gifts that you need to have. Pray that God uses you. Pray for opportunities. If we keep reading in Acts chapter 8, verse 14, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. So now I'm thinking as I'm reading this, why did they send Peter and John? I didn't just change like that my heart. Maybe they, maybe they got down and prayed and said, Lord, if you're opening up the gospel to Samaria, you know, we need to change our heart. But I think that he, they needed to see that for, for themselves. I don't know why they sent Peter and John. It's something that I sit and contemplate as I'm reading Scripture, and what it brings me back to again is examine my heart, O oh Lord. I don't need to know the answers for why they sent them or not, but I need to know the answers of why I'm not willing to go or not. You get it? <clears throat> Verse 15, On their arrival they prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit. And that can be a little confusing, and we'll talk about that. For the Holy Spirit had not fell, fallen upon them as of yet. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So here's a question. Were the Samaritans really saved? Okay? Don't dwell on this. I'm hitting it. So like I said, you think about the way you think and examine things. Verse 18, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Give me this power as well, he said, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now remember, it's the, it's, this is a battle of kings and kingdoms. You know the kings, Jesus or Satan. You know the kingdoms, the kingdom, is the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of hell. You're either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. There is a power. We fight spiritual powers in this world, spiritual powers of darkness, but we've been given God's power, the Holy Spirit, to live inside of us, to change us, to face anything that we need to face, to give us the right words to say when we need them, even if it's the last day of our lives, as we saw Stephen do. But now you've got to ask the question, was Simon really saved? Because here's a motive that you see right there. Does he want to be saved? Or does he want something that helps build him up? And then I've asked the question before, what does it matter? It matters when it becomes a problem in the church because of the doctrine that's being teach, taught. And that's why we have to study to be approved workmen, rightly handling the word of truth. Okay? Verse 20, but Peter replied, May your silver perish with you. And I already said he had a discerner, discernment of spirit. Because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. 
You have no part or share in our ministry because your heart is not right before God. I, rem I wonder if Peter remembers back to the night where they're eating the Last Supper and Jesus says, you have no part in this ministry unless I wash your feet. Hmm. How is your heart set on ministry? Not living your life, not enjoying your family, your friends, the wonderful things, your health, everything else, but how is your ministry? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus, so therefore go and make disciples. Do you understand your ministry? Do you understand why you, why you are still here? The opportunity that you have to be a witness to others, especially those that you encounter more, your family, your friends, your co-workers, even your enemies because you encounter them a lot. Okay? <clears throat> your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps He will forgive you you for the intent of your heart. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and captive to iniquity. So I have to ask myself here, what brings about salvation? Is repentance necessary or is just believing enough? Oh, and boy, I've had this conversation with a lot of Christians. And let me tell you this. One reason is Satan loves to change words in our thought process on what it means. If you look all throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, I don't care where you're reading, it tells you to repent whether you're already in a right relationship with God or whether you're trying to get to a relationship with God. Repent and turn to God. Repent primarily means to change not to change your behavior necessarily, but change your thought which will change your heart so that you change your direction. So that instead of going against God, you're now going with God. So that instead of fighting against the Holy Spirit, resisting the Holy Spirit, now you're walking in tune with the Spirit. Instead of serving another master, now you're serving Jesus and you can't help but to do that. You have to repent and then... Because we get to thinking that repentance means that it changes, changes what we do. That takes a little bit of time, doesn't it? It takes a long time. And the reason I'm putting this in here is Peter said it time and time again, but in his heart he still needed to change to love the Samaritans. Because there's 700 years of we can't stand these half-breed brothers. It takes a lot of time to change that. I could give you a million examples that you might have. <laughs> okay? I can give you a million examples that I might have. So I need to be changed. <clears throat> Jesus gave up heaven to come and die for every single human being. No matter what they look like, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done. And I guarantee you, the more you've done it, probably the harder it's going to be. But with God, all things are possible. <clears throat> then Simon answered, verse 24, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. One of your most common prayers, one of my most common prayers, is praying for those I love that they'll come to salvation. Second most common, if I think they're saved, is that they'll come to a right walk with God because they may or may not be. But you know what? God hears my prayers. He wants to answer me. It is, it, it, it is His will that all men be saved. That's why He sent His Son. But I can't save anyone through my prayers. There's hypocrisy in the church, the church that teaches that, that that can be done. So that's why you need to study again. The Scriptures don't back that up. Yes, I pray. Yes, I pray my whole life. I pray in faith. I pray hoping. I'm an active part in it. But they have to pray the prayer for themselves. They have to mean it in their heart. There's no evidence of Simon doing it at this point. Verse 25, And after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many of the Samaritan villages. Now, I don't know what happened that day, but I think Peter and John got on their knees and repented. 
because they went back and preached along the way. If they had just went there and seen what happened and then said, okay, we've accepted it, but I still had animosity in my heart, I would have went straight back to Jerusalem. But instead they preached along the way. There was a repentance and a change there in Peter's heart that you don't just read, but is obvious there. That hatred was gone. And it took someone like Philip, who never had it in the first place, to show them. Now think about how many times you can do that with your brother and sister. I can guarantee you, I'm not going to give you any examples, <laughs> but I can guarantee you that there's been plenty of times when I saw in you what brought hypocrisy into my heart. It revealed it, and I had to repent of it. Because it's a natural thing we do. And that's why we need to read God's Word daily and stay in a prayer life and be connected to one another and be connected, like Diana said, so that we know that we're connected together, truly connected, so that we can build each other up. <clears throat> so I asked these questions before. I made the statement at first. When someone believes, and you don't know that for a fact, but they become part of the body of Christ. So you have to assume that. You have to love them. You have to draw them in. You have to train them up. Okay, and then there's plenty of scriptures that talk about they depart and everything else. You look for the doctrine. You look to make sure that they're not doing anything they shouldn't be doing. And that's a difficult thing in the church, a discipline. Woo! That's why I said that's another topic for another day. But you draw them into the church and accept them that they made a genuine decision. And you try to build them up. But how do we know if they're genuine or not? Well, there's, there's Scripture that talks about that. And I'm still going to explain a little bit more. And I'm going to ask the questions again so you can be thinking about this. This is a thought process. Were the Samaritans really saved? Was Simon really saved? Is believing enough for salvation? What about that thing called repentance? What about church practices that teach that? We don't have any in this church, praise God. But what if you were in a place that had doctrine like that? Okay? Peter should have been preaching to the Samaritans all along already. But it took Philip to show him the way. So let's look at Simon. And let's look at some scripture before we answer this. Acts chapter 16 verse 31 says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Right? Amen. What does it say right after that? You and your household. Now you know that just because you believe doesn't mean your whole household b believes. I just said that was probably the biggest prayer that you have in your heart. <laughs> but that's what this verse says, right? So you can't just take this out of context. Romans 10, 9, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. But what if there's not repentance? Okay? Luke 12, 8, I tell you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will also confess him before the angels of God. Well, I can give you another verse in the Sermon on the Mount, if you read this this week, that says, depart from me. They confessed Jesus, but their hearts weren't right again. Matthew 4, 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent. Not believe, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And Peter's own words from Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent of your sins and turn to God that your sins may be wiped away. And I hope I've painted a picture again that showed that Peter definitely had to repent. Because verse 24, or 25 says, Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord. They returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many of the Samaritan villages, not one or two, but they made sure that they preached the gospel, which is what they should have been doing. So they didn't just go straight to Jerusalem. They went like this and, and did everything that they could to preach the gospel message before they got back to Jerusalem. <clears throat> Verse 13 of Acts chapter 8. Even Simon himself believed and was baptized. So I said we were going to look at Simon first. Simon believed. Simon was baptized says that Simon followed Philip closely. But if you also notice in verse 13, he was astounded by the great signs and miracles he observed. Well, I'm going to be astounded by a miracle that I see, period. But what did you do with that miracle? 
as we read this a little closer, we see that Simon wanted to be able to do that himself. You'll get into a lot of churches that do those same things that seem to be the gift is more important. The Holy Spirit gives gifts as the Holy Spirit desires to build up the body. Philip didn't doubt that Simon was saved either, did he? It's not in the scriptures there. So Simon looks pretty good at face value, doesn't he? Okay, what about the Samaritans? Verse 12, when they believed, But when they believed Philip as he preached the gospel of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Believed, baptized. But there's nothing about them following Philip like Simon did. There's nothing said about the miracles of God astounding them. Hmm. So the Samaritans look from the surface less saved than Simon, do they not? From what we have just here in Scripture. So there is a testing here because Peter doubted, I'm going to use that word with quotation marks, Simon's salvation. But there's nothing said here that Peter d d doubted the Samaritans' salvation. In fact, he preached the gospel. So I'm going to say again, be very, very careful in judge, being judgmental and pointing fingers. But if there's proof of something, examine it and follow it and train up to be a disciple. The first thing to be, to be done here is to be set your, your thought process aside, but take Simon on to train him up to see if his faith is genuine or not. Time usually tells, and time entails with Simon pretty much based on church tradition. You've probably even heard the word simony, right? That's the buying and selling of church privileges because it's a thing that came out of Simon. He, he became an uh, a antagonist to the church, so church tradition says. <clears throat> but then we've got this question with the Samaritans about the Holy Spirit. I said I'd get back to that, right? If you study this, here's what you're going to get even from commentaries and stuff. One, they weren't saved yet because it says the Holy Spirit hadn't come upon them. I, 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 don't believe that one. Number two, they were saved, but the commission, the great commission, is only for qualified people. Therefore, you've got to have a laying of hands on to put you into the, the fact that the church officials see this, that they commission you for service. That's the number two explanation. Number three is that God withheld the Holy Spirit so that Peter could do it because upon this rock I'll build a church. And you know the position that Peter became in the, in the Catholic church, Roman Catholic Church. Or the fourth, here's the one Alan's going to say, okay, is that they were saved. But because of the time and circumstance, God wanted to physically show an outpouring and He did it through Peter. Not because Peter's any better than or anything else. Because who got Peter there in the first place? Philip! Philip! Don't forget that. And then Peter laid his hands showing everyone that, look, the twelve apostles do agree with this. That tells volumes to me <laughs> doing it, Peter. tells volumes to the twelve apostles. Apostles, it tells volumes to the Jews. It tells volumes to the Samaritans. Jesus Christ died for all. And I need to take seriously the commission that He gave to all. Do you see the whole story here? You see how the church works together? Okay. What does that stand for? Peter. led to, to uh, Stephen, which then our focus goes to Philip. Then we got Simon in there. We got to figure out what to do with, but we just don't throw him out. We love him. Because if you throw him right out again, don't get this in the story, then you're saying that you're not, you're not good enough for salvation. Peter didn't do that. Peter said, repent, and maybe God will forgive you. He didn't say, go away from me, you satanic person. You're practicing sorcery. 
He did just like Stephen did and said, here's what you're doing wrong. Repent. But he had to hear his own preaching at that time. Even though the word repent's not there, Peter had to hear it so he'd repent so he wouldn't have an attitude that someone else wasn't deserving, lovely enough for the gospel message, that he was better than whatever it was that was in his heart. And then that takes you back to the next P. You can either go with Philip again, because that's who we're going to read next, or you can go back to Peter, because he goes back to Jerusalem with a changed attitude. And if you study again, you know that the twelve apostles did get dispersed out of Jerusalem, and died in, most of them died in foreign countries for their faith, because they were not ashamed of the gospel. They loved even their enemies. You see all these principles of Jesus coming apart? Okay, so let's go what you might have read this week if you were reading through uh, Matthew. Are you reading? Are you studying? Are you keeping up with your daily Psalms? Okay, be asking one another to talk about what you... I, I did it in the prayer this morning if you didn't catch it because the Psalm that we just read yesterday and today, it painted a picture and a lot of the Psalms are that way that evil prosper. Well, that, it does look like that in this world. But we know the whole outcome, and they will have to pay for their sins. I will have to pay for my sins, but my sins have been forgiven if I truly believe in Jesus Christ, and if I truly believe in Him. There's no way that I can't live for Him, and no way that I can't proclaim His name. That's how I know my faith is genuine. But in Matthew chapter 7, <clears throat> this is the end of the... Sermon on the Mount. We'll start in verse 12. In everything then, do to others as you would have them do to you. We even have a story you know, about that where there's a good person that is a Samaritan. Remember? Well, the, the irony in that and how it points fingers at me. For this is the essence of the law and the prophets. And remember that that's what uh, Peter had. That's what Stephen had, that's what Philip had. They had some Old Testament writings, and prom probably if they had any, it was the Psalms. P Peter didn't go read and say, oh, this is, I mean, Philip didn't go read, hey, this is the Great Commission right here. He said he may have never even heard those exact words, but every Christian knows it because it's written on their heart, and they know they've got to live a holy life, and they know they've got to proclaim. <clears throat> Verse 13, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. So this is a warning. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the way that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now look at the next words. Beware of false prophets. They're going to be in the church. That's why I told you. It mattered, but it did matter. You can't point fingers. at. You, I don't think you're saved yet. You prove it to me. But when they come into your fold... You've got to examine and make sure that cancer didn't just come into your body. You train them up, okay? <clears throat> Beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inward, inwardly, inwardly, they still are desiring the ways of the wor world. They are ravenous wolves. They don't know it, but they're working for King Satan rather than King Jesus. So what do we do then? By their fruit you will recognize them. This is so profound because both are fruit trees, it looks like here. They are. But one produces bad fruit, one produces good fruit. You know what the problem is with most churches? No one's producing fruit. Yeah, that's what I said. So we need to be producing fruit. And there will be many of those that produce fruit that look like they've done it with the right intentions, but they've done it with the wrong intentions. By their fruit you will recognize them. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. So if we really want to look at the problem, it wouldn't be the problem of is Simon saved. It is, or is a lot of the church saved. Because are they producing fruit? Now do you see where I brought all this point around? I could ask all these questions of a lot of people, including myself at many times in my Christian walk. How's that? I point my fingers right here. Because at many times there wasn't any fruit. There wasn't any proclaiming. There was bitterness in my heart. And I believed 
but I certainly needed to repent. <clears throat> a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, by their fruit you will recognize them. Okay, so let's figure this out. Then the next words are, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. So we can examine the fruit to tell if the tree is really a genuine tree of good fruit. Simon, you could tell that his intent was to gain the power of the Holy Spirit so he could build himself up, edify himself. So more than likely, Alan says... He was not saved. But that's not the point. <laughs> that's not the point at all. The point is, am I saved and do I look like Christ in this world and am I proclaiming Him? And I hope you see what Philip led Peter to do and believe and how he responded to it. By their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Takes me back to the prayer in chapter 5. And not my will but yours, Lord, which I pray all the time, because I am constantly in a battle of that. Many, not just one Simon, many, many out of those Samaritans, many out of the people in, in Jerusalem that said they believed. We don't know. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name did we not drive out demons? And perform many miracles, many signs that looked like they were saved. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Because that's what they're doing. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and, and puts them into practice is like a man who has built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the torrents raged, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yes, it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the torrents raged, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its collapse. Just like the psalmist tells us in Psalm chapter 10, I think is what the chapter is. It may look like they're prospering. It may look like they're saved. But it's a heart decision. How is your heart? Peter's need a little tweaking. And thank goodness there was a Greek believer there named Philip that showed him by the way he lived, the joy that was in his heart, that Peter needed to repent of what he thought and did. <clears throat> Simon wanted his power as a showpiece. His eyes were the problem. Jesus said, said that already in the chapter before in Matthew chapter 6. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. This is what Simon was doing. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Where moth and rust do not destroy. Obvious Philip was doing that. He lost his home and everything. But he had to tell people about Jesus Christ. And where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. Simon was fixing his eyes on things he could do on this earth to build himself up. Philip was fixing his eyes on Jesus. There's your difference. <clears throat> the eyes are the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body or your, the whole tree will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I told you what the sin of simony is. That's where the story goes throughout history and the outcome of what Simon was in relationship to the church. But I want to take you back to the questions I said before. When someone is saved... They come into the body. Does it matter? Yes, it matters. But our job is not to point fingers at them. It's to train them up to be disciples. I can give you a million examples again of how people came to salvation years later. If any of you have done walks, I've heard so many testimonies how someone came to true salvation at a walk where they thought they were before. It's our job to be 
tied into one another, united one another in the body of Christ, training up disciples, just like the Great Commission says, all of us doing that, bringing glory in God the Father, living a life holy because that is pleasing to God and proclaiming Jesus Christ because we can't help but doing anything else. If that's the way that we're living, then we're doing it right. Last week I told you and gave you the scripture that it was a message of forgiveness. This week I'm showing you that, that Peter had to realize to forgive so that he could forgive others so that God would forgive him, as Jesus says in the uh, Sermon on the Mount also. But to do that, you do have to repent. Now I know last week, because somebody came up to me and said, you were pointing fingers at me basically, that it hits us sometimes. And we do need to repent. If that's the case, repent. Whether it's to salvation or it's to loving your enemy or whatever it is, repent and turn to God so that your sins will be forgiven, so that your prayers will be heard, so that you can live a life that brings glory and honor to God. This new life He has created in Christ Jesus. What would have happened if Philip wouldn't have gone? If Peter wouldn't have repented? God, Jesus would have still built his church, but he wouldn't have done it that way. He would because he already said to Simon, upon this rock I build this church. Yes, don't get me out of context there. But God wants to use each and every one of you to draw others into the kingdom. What a privilege, what an honor. Verse 25, And after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many of the Samaritan village. The Great Commission unfolding. Everyone that is a believer has a part in the body of Christ. That was the scriptures that Merle read. And for the body to work effectively, we have to have parts that are working effectively. God many times uses ordinary folk, not the elect, to bring about His purpose. To do, to go and tell, to love. The chief agents in the expansion of Christianity are not always the ones that are so obvious. Those who love Jesus, or better yet, those who know the love of Jesus, make a huge, huge difference in the kingdom of God. Even circumstances that you don't want to face, like being driven from your home, or cancer, or anything else, can be used to bring God glory. Look at those situations and look at how you can use them to proclaim God. Did you know this? This relates to the persecution in Jerusalem because this is what scattered them and grew the church, right? Did you know that if one of the arms of a starfish is severed off, a new one will grow in its place? Did you know that? Yeah. In fact, if a starfish is cut up, any piece that contains a part of the central disk, no matter how big or small will develop into a new starfish. Some oyster fishermen found that out the hard way. You know where this is going. When their oyster beds became infested with starfish, think of that, this is Christians. The fishermen cut up the starfish they caught and tossed them back into the water. Rather than destroying them, they actually caused them to multiply. Wow. As our story progresses, we're going to see what happens to a guy named Saul, aren't we? And how he's single-handedly persecuting the church and, dr and driving it out to the places he would later go in even further to the utter ends of the earth, building and establishing churches. God is so big. I don't care how big your problem is. God is bigger whether it's a problem of animosity in your heart or whatever it is, God is so much bigger and He's calling out for you to be an active part of the body of Christ. 
1 Corinthians chapter 12 is what I'm going to close with. I'm going to read it from the message again because this is just in His words. Sometimes it blows me away. <laughs> because 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about spiritual gifts in the body. And then it goes into the most excellent way, which is what? Love. Okay? So chapter 12 from the message. What I want to, want to talk to you about is the various ways God's Spirit get work, gets worked out into our lives. This is complex and often misunderstood, but I want you to be informed and knowledgeable. Remember how you were when you didn't know God, led from one phony God to another, never knowing what you were doing, just doing it because everybody else did it. It's different in this life. God wants us to use our intelligence to seek to understand as, as well as we can. For instance, by using your head, you know perfectly well that the Spirit of God would never prompt anyone to say, Jesus be damned, nor would anyone be inclined to say, Jesus is master without inside of the Holy Spirit. There's your salvation, whether it's true or not. Verse 4, God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's Spirit. Spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they all originate in God's Spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere. God Himself is behind it all. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful. Wise counsel, clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between the Spirit's tongue and interpretation of tongues. All these gifts have a common origin, but are handed out one by one as the Spirit of God sees fit. He decides who gets what and when they get it. You can easily enough see how this kind of thing works by looking no further than your own body. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells. But no matter how many parts you can name, you're still one body. It's exactly the same with Christ. By means of His own Spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives. We each used to, we each used to independently call our own shots. But then we entered into a large and integrated life in which He has the final say in everything. That is what we proclaim in word and action when we are baptized. Each of us now is a part of His resurrection body, refreshed and sustained at one fountain, His Spirit, where we all come to drink the old labels we used to use to identify ourselves, like Jew or Greek, slave or free, are no longer useful. We need something larger, more comprehensive. I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. If the foot said, I'm not elegant like the hand, embellished with rings, I guess I don't belong to this body, would that make it so? If the ear said, I'm not beautiful like the eye, transparent and expressive, I don't deserve a place on the head, would you want to remove it from the body? If the body was all eye, how could it hear? If all ear, how could it smell? As it is, we see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where He wanted it to be. But I also want you to think about how this keeps your significance from getting blown up into self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it's only because of what you're a part of. An enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be the body, but a monster. But we, ha but we have is one body with many parts. Each is proper size, each in its proper place. The part is important on its own. Can you, no part is important on its own. Can you imagine an eye telling a hand, get lost, I don't need you? Or a head telling a foot, you're fired, your job has been phased out. As a matter of fact, in practice, it works the other way. The lower the part, the more basic, therefore, the more necessary. You can live without an eye, for instance, but not without a stomach. When it's part of your own body you are, concern, you are concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible or clothed, higher or lower. You give it dignity and honor just as it is without comparisons. If anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion, digestion to full-bodied hair? Thought I'd look up when I said that, sorry. 
The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. You are Christ's body. That's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of the body does your part mean anything. You're familiar with some of the parts that God has formed in His church, which is His body. Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracle workers, healers, helpers, organizers, those who pray in tongues. But it's obvious by now, isn't it, that Christ's church is a complete body and not a gigantic undimensional, undimensional part. It's not all apostle, not all prophet, not all miracle worker, not all healer, not all prayer in tongues, not, not all interpreter of tongues. And yet some of you keep competing for so-called important parts. But now I want to lay out for you a far better way. Boy, how does that ring into our story of Simon and Philip and Peter and how we need to be as a body of Christ. Father in heaven, we do thank you that the Spirit has indwelled us, that we are children of the Most High. Lord, we thank you for any and every gift that you give us, every, any and every ability that you give us, from the least to the small. Lord, we know that each and every one of us is important. And Lord, may everyone feel that way. May the joy that you've given us, the peace that you've given us, May it overwhelm us because of your love. May we love others, even our enemies, because of the love that you have given us. May we pray steadfastly, Lord. May we be united to one another. May we be compassionate and caring as Christ gave up his life to save us. May we be a church that draws others into the kingdom, each and every part. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.